Section five of the Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, gentlemen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, gentlemen, by Washington Irving. Rip Van Winkle. A posthumous writing of Diedrich Knickerbocker. By Woden, God of Saxons, from whence comes Wednesday, that is, Woden's Day. Truth is the thing that ever I will keep unto thilk day in which I creep into my sepulchre. Cartwright. The following tale was found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker, an old gentleman of New York, who was very curious in the Dutch history of the province and the manners of the descendants from its primitive settlers. His historical researches, however, did not lie so much among books as among men, for the former are lamentably scanty on his favorite topics whereas he found the old burghers, and still more their wives, rich in that legendary lore so invaluable to true history. Whenever, therefore, he happened upon a genuine Dutch family snugly shut up in its low-roofed farmhouse under a spreading sycamore, he looked upon it as a little clasped volume of black letter, and studied it with the zeal of a bookworm. The results of all these researches was a history of the province during the reign of the Dutch governors, which he published some years since. There have been various opinions as to the literary character of his work, and, to tell the truth, it is not a whit better than it should be. Its chief merit is its scrupulous accuracy which indeed was a little questioned on its first appearance but has since been completely established and it is now admitted into all historical collections as a book of unquestionable authority the old gentleman died shortly after the publication of his work and now that he is dead and gone it cannot do much harm to his memory to say that his time might have been much better employed in weightier labors. He, however, was apt to ride his hobby his own way, and though it did now and then kick up the dust a little in the eyes of his neighbors, and grieve the spirit of some friends, for whom he felt the truest deference and affection, yet his errors and follies are remembered, quote, more in sorrow than in anger, end quote. and it begins to be suspected that he never intended to injure or offend. But however his memory may be appreciated by critics, it is still held dear among many folks whose good opinion is well worth having, particularly by certain biscuit makers, who have gone so far as to imprint his likeness on their New Year cakes and have thus given him a chance for immortality, almost equal to the being stamped on a Waterloo medal or a Queen Anne's farthing. Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family, and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains, and they are regarded by all the good wives far and near as perfect barometers. When the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple, and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes, when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they will gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, 
which in the last rays of the setting sun will glow and light up like a crown of glory at the foot of these fairy mountains the voyager may have descried the light smoke curling up from a village whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape it is a little village of great antiquity having been founded by some of the dutch colonists in the early times of the province just about the beginning of the government of the good peter stuyvesant may he rest in peace and there were some of the houses of the original settlers standing within a few years built of small yellow bricks brought from holland having latticed windows and gable fronts surmounted with weathercocks in that same village and in one of these very houses which to tell the precise truth was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten there lived many years since while the country was yet a province of great britain a simple good-natured fellow of the name of rip van winkle he was a descendant of the van winkles who figured so gallantly in the chivalrous days of peter stuyvesant and accompanied him to the siege of fort christina he inherited however but little of the martial character of his ancestors i have observed that he was a simple good-natured man he was moreover a kind neighbor and an obedient henpecked husband indeed to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity for those men are apt to be obsequious and conciliating abroad who are under the discipline of shrews at home their tempers doubtless are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation and a curtain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long-suffering a termagant wife may therefore in some respects be considered a tolerable blessing and if so rip van winkle was thrice blessed certain it is that he was a great favorite among all the good wives of the village who as usual with the amiable sex took his part in all family squabbles and never failed whenever they talked those matters over in their evening gossipings to lay all the blame on dame van winkle the children of the village too would shout with joy whenever he approached he assisted at their sports made their playthings taught them to fly kites and shoot marbles and told them long stories of ghosts witches and indians whenever he went dodging about the village he was surrounded by a troop of them hanging on his skirts clambering on his back and playing a thousand tricks on him with impunity and not a dog would bark at him throughout the neighborhood the great error in rip's composition was an insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor it could not be for want of assiduity or perseverance for he would sit on a wet rock with a rod as long and heavy as a tartar's lance and fish all day without a murmur even though he should not be encouraged by a single nibble he would carry a fowling piece on his shoulder for hours together trudging through woods and swamps and uphill and down dale to shoot a few squirrels or wild pigeons he would never refuse to assist a neighbor even in the roughest toil and was a foremost man in all country frolics for husking indian corn or building stone fences the women of the village too used to employ him to run their errands and to do such little odd jobs as their less obliging husbands would not do for them in a word rip was ready to attend to anybody's business but his own but as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order he found it impossible 
In fact, he declared it was of no use to work on his farm. It was the most pestilent little piece of ground in the whole country. Everything about it went wrong in spite of him. His fences were continually falling to pieces. His cow would either go astray or get among the cabbages. Weeds were sure to grow quicker in his fields than anywhere else. The rain always made a point of setting in just as he had some outdoor work to do. So that, though his patrimonial estate had dwindled away under his management, acre by acre, until there was little more left than a mere patch of Indian corn and potatoes, yet it was the worst conditioned farm in the neighborhood. His children, too, were as ragged and wild as if they belonged to nobody. His son Rip, an urchin begotten in his own likeness, promised to inherit the habits with the old clothes of his father. He was generally seen trooping like a colt at his mother's heels, equipped in a pair of his father's cast-off galligaskins, which he had much ado to hold up with one hand, as a fine lady does her train in bad weather. Rip Van Winkle, however, was one of those happy mortals of foolish, well-oiled dispositions, who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever can be got with least thought or trouble, and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment. But his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night, her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of the kind, and that, by frequent use, had grown into a habit. He shrugged his shoulders, shook his head, cast up his eyes, but said nothing. This, however, always provoked a fresh volley from his wife, so that he was fain to draw off his forces and take to the outside of the house, the only side which, in truth, belongs to a henpecked husband. Rip's sole domestic adherent was his dog Wolf, who was as much henpecked as his master, for Dame Van Winkle regarded them as companions in idleness, and even looked upon Wolf with an evil eye as the cause of his master's going so often astray. True it is, in all points of spirit befitting an honorable dog, he was as courageous an animal as ever scoured the woods. But what courage can withstand the evil doing and all besetting terrors of a woman's tongue? The moment Wolf entered the house, his crest fell, his tail drooped to the ground, or curled between his legs. He sneaked about with a gallows air, casting many a sidelong glance at Dame Van Winkle, and at the least flourish of a broomstick or ladle he would fly to the door with yelping precipitation. Times grew worse and worse with Rip Van Winkle as years of matrimony rolled on. A tart temper never mellows with age, and a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use. For a long while he used to console himself, when driven from home, by frequenting a kind of perpetual club of the sages, philosophers, and other idle personages of the village, which held its sessions on a bench before a small inn, designated by a rubicund portrait of His Majesty George the Third. Here they used to sit in the shade through a long, lazy summer's day, talking listlessly over village gossip, or telling endless, sleepy stories about nothing. But it would have been worth any statesman's money to have heard the profound discussions which sometimes took place, 
when by chance an old newspaper fell into their hands from some passing traveller how solemnly they would listen to the contents as drawled out by derrick van bummel the schoolmaster a dapper learned little man who was not to be daunted by the most gigantic word in the dictionary and how sagely they would deliberate upon public events some months after they had taken place the opinions of this junto were completely controlled by nicholas vedder a patriarch of the village and landlord of the inn at the door of which he took his seat from morning till night just moving sufficiently to avoid the sun and keep in the shade of a large tree so that the neighbors could tell the hour by his movements as accurately as by a sundial it is true he was rarely heard to speak but smoked his pipe incessantly his adherents however for every great man has his adherents perfectly understood him and knew how to gather his opinions when anything that was read or related displeased him he was observed to smoke his pipe vehemently and to send forth frequent and angry puffs but when pleased he would inhale the smoke slowly and tranquilly and emit it in light and placid clouds and sometimes taking the pipe from his mouth and letting the fragrant vapor curl about his nose would gravely nod his head in token of perfect approbation from even this stronghold the unlucky rip was at length routed by his termagant wife who would suddenly break in upon the tranquillity of the assemblage and call the members all to naught nor was that august personage nicholas vedder himself sacred from the daring tongue of this terrible virago who charged him outright with encouraging her husband in habits of idleness poor rip was at last reduced almost to despair and his only alternative to escape from the labor of the farm and the clamor of his wife was to take gun in hand and stroll away into the woods here he would sometimes seat himself at the foot of a tree and share the contents of his wallet with wolf with whom he sympathized as a fellow sufferer in persecution poor wolf he would say thy mistress leads thee a dog's life of it but never mind my lad whilst i live thou shalt never want a friend to stand by thee wolf would wag his tail look wistfully in his master's face and if dogs can feel pity i verily believe he reciprocated the sentiment with all his heart in a long ramble of the kind on a fine autumnal day rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the Catskill Mountains. He was after his favorite sport of squirrel shooting, and the still solitudes had echoed and re echoed with the reports of his gun. Panting and fatigued, he threw himself late in the afternoon on a green knoll covered with mountain herbage that crowned the brow of a precipice from an opening between the trees he could overlook all the lower country for many a mile of rich woodland he saw at a distance the lordly hudson far far below him moving on its silent but majestic course with the reflection of a purple cloud or the sail of a lagging bark here and there sleeping on its glassy bosom and at last losing itself in the blue highlands on the other side he looked down into the deep mountain glen wild lonely and shagged the bottom filled with fragments from the impending cliffs and scarcely lighted by the reflected rays of the setting sun for some time rip lay musing on this scene evening was gradually advancing the mountains began to throw their long blue shadows over the valleys he saw that it would be dark long before he could reach the village 
and he heaved a heavy sigh when he thought of encountering the terrors of Dame Van Winkle. As he was about to descend, he heard a voice from a distance hallooing, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! He looked around, but could see nothing but a crow winging its solitary flight across the mountain. He thought his fancy must have deceived him, and turned again to descend, when he heard the same cry ring through the still evening air, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! At the same time Wolf bristled up his back, and, giving a low growl, skulked to his master's side, looking fearfully down into the glen. Rip now felt a vague apprehension stealing over him. He looked anxiously in the same direction, and perceived a strange figure slowly toiling up the rocks, and bending under the weight of something he carried on his back. He was surprised to see any human being in this lonely and unfrequented place, but supposing it to be some one of the neighborhood in need of his assistance, he hastened down to yield it. On nearer approach he was still more surprised at the singularity of the stranger's appearance. He was a short, square-built old fellow, with thick bushy hair and a grizzled beard, his dress was of the antique Dutch fashion, a cloth jerkin strapped round the waist, several pairs of breeches, the outer one of ample volume, decorated with rows of buttons down the sides, and bunches at the knees. He bore on his shoulders a stout keg that seemed full of liquor, and made signs for Rip to approach and assist him with the load. Though rather shy and distrustful of this new acquaintance, Rip complied with his usual alacrity, and mutually relieving each other, they clambered up a narrow gully, apparently the dry bed of a mountain torrent. As they ascended, Rip every now and then heard long rolling peals, like distant thunder, that seemed to issue out of a deep ravine or rather cleft between lofty rocks, toward which their rugged path conducted. He paused for an instant, but, supposing it to be the muttering of one of those transient thunderstorms which often take place in the mountain heights, he proceeded. Passing through the ravine, they came to a hollow, like a small amphitheatre, surrounded by perpendicular precipices, over the brinks of which impending trees shot their branches, so that you only caught glimpses of the azure sky and the bright evening cloud. During the whole time Rip and his companion had labored on in silence, for though the former marveled greatly what could be the object of carrying a keg of liquor up this wild mountain, Yet there was something strange and incomprehensible about the unknown that inspired awe and checked familiarity. On entering the amphitheater new objects of wonder presented themselves. On a level spot in the center was a company of odd-looking personages playing at ninepins. They were dressed in quaint outlandish fashion. Some wore short doublets, others jerkins, with long knives in their belts, and most of them had enormous breeches, of similar style with that of the guides. Their visages, too, were peculiar. One had a large head, broad face, and small piggish eyes. The face of another seemed to consist entirely of nose, and was surmounted by a white sugar-loaf hat, set off with a little red cock's tail. They all had beards of various shapes and colors. There was one who seemed to be the commander. He was a stout old gentleman with a weather-beaten countenance. He wore a laced doublet, broad belt and hanger, high-crowned hat and feather, red stockings and high-heeled shoes, with roses in them. The whole group reminded Rip of the figures in an old Flemish painting in the parlor of Domeny van Schaik, the village parson, 
and which had been brought over from Holland at the time of the settlement. What seemed particularly odd to Rip was that, though these folks were evidently amusing themselves, yet they maintained the gravest faces, the most mysterious silence, and were withal the most melancholy party of pleasure he had ever witnessed. Nothing interrupted the stillness of the scene but the noise of the balls, which, whenever they were rolled, echoed along the mountains like rumbling peals of thunder. As Rip and his companion approached them, they suddenly desisted from their play, and stared at him with such a fixed statue-like gaze, and such strange, uncouth, lacklustre countenances, that his heart turned within him, and his knees smote together. His companion now emptied the contents of the keg into large flagons, and made signs to him to wait upon the company. He obeyed with fear and trembling. They quaffed the liquor in profound silence, and then returned to their game. By degrees Rip's awe and apprehension subsided. He even ventured, when no eye was fixed upon him, to taste the beverage which he found had much of the flavour of excellent Hollands. He was naturally a thirsty soul, and was soon tempted to repeat the draught. One taste provoked another, and he reiterated his visits to the flagon so often that at length his senses were overpowered, his eyes swam in his head, his head gradually declined, and he fell into a deep sleep. On waking he found himself on the green knoll whence he had first seen the old man of the glen. He rubbed his eyes. It was a bright, sunny morning. The birds were hopping and twittering among the bushes, and the eagle was wheeling aloft and breasting the pure mountain breeze. Surely, thought Rip, I have not slept here all night. He recalled the occurrences before he fell asleep. The strange man with the keg of liquor, the mountain ravine, the wild retreat among the rocks, the woebegone party at ninepins, the flagon, oh, that flagon, that wicked flagon, thought Rip. What excuse shall I make to Dame Van Winkle? He looked round for his gun, but in place of the clean, well-oiled fowling-piece, he found an old firelock lying by him, the barrel encrusted with rust, the lock falling off, and the stock worm-eaten. He now suspected that the grave roisterers of the mountains had put a trick upon him, and, having dosed him with liquor, had robbed him of his gun. Wolf, too, had disappeared, but he might have strayed away after a squirrel or partridge. He whistled after him, and shouted his name, but all in vain. The echoes repeated his whistle and shout, but no dog was to be seen. He determined to revisit the scene of the last evening's gamble, and, if he met with any of the party, to demand his dog and gun. As he rose to walk he found himself stiff in the joints, and wanting in his usual activities. These mountain beds do not agree with me, thought Rip, and if this frolic should lay me up with a fit of the rheumatism, I shall have a blessed time with Dame Van Winkle. With some difficulty he got down into the glen. He found the gully up which he and his companion had ascended the preceding evening, but, to his astonishment, a mountain stream was now foaming down it, leaping from rock to rock, and filling the glen with babbling murmurs. He, however, made shift to scramble up its sides, working his toilsome way through thickets of birch, sassafras, and witch-hazel, and sometimes tripped up or entangled by the wild grape-vines that twisted their coils and tendrils from tree to tree, and spread a kind of network in his path. At length he reached to where the ravine had opened through the cliffs to the amphitheatre. But no traces of such opening remained. The rocks presented a high, impenetrable wall, 
over which the torrent came tumbling in a sheet of feathery foam, and fell into a broad, deep basin, black from the shadows of the surrounding forest. Here, then, poor Rip was brought to a stand. He again called and whistled after his dog. He was only answered by the cawing of a flock of idle crows, sporting high in the air about a dry tree that overhung a sunny precipice, and who, secure in their elevation, seemed to look down and scoff at the poor man's perplexities. What was to be done? The morning was passing away, and Rip felt famished for want of his breakfast. He grieved to give up his dog and gun. He dreaded to meet his wife. But it would not do to starve among the mountains. He shook his head, shouldered the rusty firelock, and, with a heart full of trouble and anxiety, turned his steps homeward. As he approached the village, he met a number of people, but none whom he knew, which somewhat surprised him for he had thought himself acquainted with every one in the country round. Their dress, too, was of a different fashion from that to which he was accustomed. They all stared at him with equal marks of surprise, and whenever they cast eyes upon him, invariably stroked their chins. The constant recurrence of this gesture induced Rip involuntarily to do the same, when, to his astonishment, he found his beard had grown a foot long. He had now entered the skirts of the village. A troop of strange children ran at his heels, hooting after him, and pointing at his grey beard. The dogs, too, not one of which he recognized for an old acquaintance, barked at him as he passed. The very village was altered. It was larger and more populous. There were rows of houses which he had never seen before, and those which had been his familiar haunts had disappeared. Strange names were over the doors, strange faces at the windows. Everything was strange. His mind now misgave him. He began to doubt whether both he and the world around him were not bewitched. Surely this was his native village, which he had left but a day before. There stood the Catskill Mountains. There ran the Silver Hudson at a distance. There was every hill and dale precisely as it had always been. Rip was sorely perplexed. That flagon last night, thought he, has addled my poor head sadly. It was, with some difficulty, that he found the way to his own house, which he approached with silent awe, expecting every moment to hear the shrill voice of Dame Van Winkle. He found the house gone to decay. The roof had fallen in, the windows shattered, and the doors off the hinges. A half-starved dog, that looked like Wolf, was skulking about it. Rip called him by name, but the cur snarled, showed his teeth, and passed on. This was an unkind cut indeed. My very dog, sighed poor Rip, has forgotten me. He entered the house which, to tell the truth, Dame Van Winkle had always kept in neat order. It was empty, forlorn, and apparently abandoned. This desolateness overcame all his connubial fears. He called loudly for his wife and children. The lonely chambers rang for a moment with his voice, and then all again was silence. He now hurried forth, and hastened to his old resort, the village inn, but it too was gone. A large, rickety wooden building stood in its place, with great gaping windows, some of them broken and mended with old hats and petticoats, and over the door was painted, The Union Hotel, by Jonathan Doolittle. Instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little Dutch inn of yore, 
there now was reared a tall naked pole with something on the top that looked like a red nightcap and from it was fluttering a flag on which was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes all this was strange and incomprehensible he recognized on the sign however the ruby face of king george under which he had smoked so many a peaceful pipe but even this was singularly metamorphosed the red coat was changed for one of blue and buff a sword was held in the hand instead of a sceptre the head was decorated with a cocked hat and underneath was painted in large characters general washington there was as usual a crowd of folk about the door but none that rip recollected the very character of the people seemed changed there was a busy bustling disputatious tone about it instead of the accustomed phlegm and drowsy tranquillity he looked in vain for the sage nicholas vedder with his broad face double chin and fair long pipe uttering clouds of tobacco smoke instead of idle speeches or van bummel the schoolmaster doling forth the contents of an ancient newspaper in place of these a lean bilious looking fellow with his pockets full of handbills was haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens elections members of congress liberty bunkers hill heroes of seventy six and other words which were a perfect pablonish jargon to the bewildered van winkle the appearance of rip with his long grizzled beard his rusty fowling piece his uncouth dress and the army of women and children at his heels soon attracted the attention of the tavern politicians they crowded round him eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity the orator bustled up to him and drawing him partly aside inquired on which side he voted rip stared in vacant stupidity another short but busy little fellow pulled him by the arm and rising on tiptoed inquired in his ear whether he was federal or democrat rip was equally at a loss to comprehend the question when a knowing self-important old gentleman in a sharp cocked hat made his way through the crowd putting them to the right and left with his elbows as he passed and planting himself before van winkle with one arm akimbo the other resting on his cane his keen eyes and sharp hat penetrating as it were into his very soul demanded in an austere tone what brought him to the election with a gun on his shoulder and a mob at his heels and whether he meant to breed a riot in the village alas gentlemen cried rip somewhat dismayed i am a poor quiet man a native of the place and a loyal subject of the king god bless him here a general shout burst from the bystanders a tory a tory a spy a refugee hustle him away with him it was with great difficulty that the self-important man in the cocked hat restored order and having assumed a tenfold austerity of brow demanded again of the unknown culprit what he came there for and whom he was seeking the poor man humbly assured him that he meant no harm but merely came there in search of some of his neighbors who used to keep about the tavern well who are they name them rip bethought himself a moment and inquired where's nicholas vedder there was a silence for a little while when an old man replied in a thin piping voice nicholas vedder why he is dead and gone these eighteen years there was a wooden tombstone in the churchyard that used to tell all about him but that's rotten and gone too where's brom dutcher oh he went off to the army in the beginning of the war some say he was killed at the storming of stony point others say he was drowned in a squall at the foot of antony's nose i don't know he never came back again 
"'Where's Van Brummel, the schoolmaster? "'He went off to the wars, too, "'was a great militia general, and is now in Congress.' "'Rip's heart died away. "'At hearing of these sad changes in his home and friends, and finding himself thus alone in the world. Every answer puzzled him, too, by treating of such enormous lapses of time, and of matters which he could not understand. War, Congress, Stony Point. He had no courage to ask after any more friends, but cried out in despair, "'Does nobody here know Rip Van Winkle?' "'Oh, Rip Van Winkle!' exclaimed two or three. "'Oh, to be sure! "'That's Rip Van Winkle yonder, leaning against the tree.' Rip looked and beheld a precise counterpart of himself as he went up the mountain, apparently as lazy and certainly as ragged. The poor fellow was now completely confounded. He doubted his own identity and whether he was himself or another man. In the midst of his bewilderment, the man in the cocked hat demanded who he was and what was his name. "'God knows!' exclaimed he, at his wit's end. "'I'm not myself. I'm somebody else. That's me, yonder. No, that's somebody else. Got into my shoes. I was myself last night. But I fell asleep on the mountain, and they've changed my gun, and everything's changed. And I'm changed. And I can't tell what's my name or who I am. The bystanders began now to look at each other, nod, wink significantly, and tap their fingers against their foreheads. There was a whisper, also, about securing the gun, and keeping the old fellow from doing mischief. At the very suggestion of which the self-important man with the cocked hat retired with some precipitation. At this critical moment a fresh, comely woman pressed through the throng to get a peep at the grey-bearded man. She had a chubby child in her arms, which, frightened at his looks, began to cry. "'Hush, Rip!' cried she. "'Hush, you little fool! The old man won't hurt you. The name of the child, the air of the mother, the tone of her voice, all awakened a train of recollections in his mind. "'What is your name, my good woman?' asked he. "'Judith Cardinier. And your father's name? Ah, poor man, Rip Van Winkle was his name. But it's twenty years since he went away from home with his gun, and never has been heard of since. His dog came home without him, but whether he shot himself or was carried away by the Indians, nobody can tell. I was then but a little girl. Rip had but one more question to ask, but he put it with a faltering voice. "'Where's your mother?' "'Oh, she too had died but a short time since. "'She broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a New England peddler. "'There was a drop of comfort at least in this intelligence. "'The honest man could contain himself no longer. "'He caught his daughter and her child in his arms. "'I am your father,' cried he, "'young Rip Van Winkle once, old Rip Van Winkle now.' "'Does nobody know poor Rip Van Winkle?' All stood amazed until an old woman, tottering out from among the crowd, put her hand to her brow, and peering under it in his face for a moment, exclaimed, "'Sure enough, it is Rip Van Winkle. It is himself. Welcome home again, old neighbor. Why, where have you been these twenty long years?' Rip's story was soon told for the whole twenty years had been to him but as one night. The neighbors stared when they heard it. Some were seen to wink at each other, and put their tongues in their cheeks. And the self-important man in the cocked hat, who, when the alarm was over, had returned to the field, screwed down the corners of his mouth, and shook his head, upon which there was a general shaking of the head throughout the assemblage. It was determined, however, to take the opinion of old Peter Vanderdonk, who was seen slowly advancing up the road. He was a descendant of the historian of that name, 
who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the province. Peter was the most ancient inhabitant of the village, and well versed in all the wonderful events and traditions of the neighborhood. He recollected Rip at once, and corroborated his story in the most satisfactory manner. He assured the company that it was a fact, handed down from his ancestor the historian, that the Catskill Mountains had always been haunted by strange beings, that it was affirmed that the great Hendrick Hudson, the first discoverer of the river and country, kept a kind of vigil there every twenty years with his crew of the half-moon, being permitted in this way to revisit the scenes of his enterprise and keep a guardian eye upon the river and the great city called by his name that his father had once seen them in their old Dutch dresses playing at ninepins in the hollow of the mountain, and that he himself had heard one summer afternoon the sound of their balls like distant peals of thunder. To make a long story short, the company broke up and returned to the more important concerns of the election. Rip's daughter took him home to live with her, she had a snug, well-furnished house, and a stout, cheery farmer for a husband, whom Rip recollected for one of the urchins that used to climb upon his back. As to Rip's son and heir, who was the ditto of himself, seen leaning against the tree, he was employed to work on the farm, but evinced an hereditary disposition to attend to anything else but his business. Rip now resumed his old walks and habits. He soon found many of his former cronies, though all rather the worse for the wear and tear of time, and preferred making friends among the rising generation, with whom he soon grew into great favor. Having nothing to do at home, and being arrived at that happy age, when a man can be idle with impunity, he took his place once more on the bench, at the inn door, and was reverenced as one of the patriarchs of the village, and a chronicle of the old times, quote, before the war. It was some time before he could get into the regular track of gossip, or could be made to comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his torpor, how that there had been a revolutionary war, that the country had thrown off the yoke of old England, and that, instead of being a subject to His Majesty George the Third, he was now a free citizen of the United States. Rip, in fact, was no politician. The changes of states and empires made but little impression on him, but there was one species of despotism under which he had long groaned, and that was petticoat government. Happily, that was at an end. He had got his neck out of the yoke of matrimony, and could go in and out whenever he pleased, without dreading the tyranny of Dame Van Winkle. Whenever her name was mentioned, however, he shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, and cast up his eyes, which might pass either for an expression of resignation to his fate, or joy at his deliverance. He used to tell his story to every stranger that arrived at Mr. Doolittle's hotel. He was observed at first to vary on some points every time he told it, which was doubtless owing to his having so recently awaked. It at last settled down precisely to the tale I have related, and not a man, woman, or child in the neighborhood but knew it by heart. Some always pretended to doubt the reality of it, and insisted that Rip had been out of his head, and that this was one point on which he always remained flighty. The old Dutch inhabitants, however, almost universally gave it full credit. Even to this day they never hear a thunderstorm of a summer afternoon about the Catskill, but they say Hendrik Hudson and his crew are at their game of ninepins. And it is a common wish of all hand-picked husbands in the neighborhood, when life hangs heavy on their hands, that they might have a quieting draught out of Rip Van Winkle's flagon. 
Note. The foregoing tale, one would suspect, had been suggested to Mr. Knickerbocker by a little German superstition about the Emperor Frederick de Rothbart and the Kyphoisar mountain. The subjoined note, however, which had appended to this tale, shows that it is an absolute fact narrated with his usual fidelity. Quote, the story of Rip Van Winkle may seem incredible to many, but nevertheless I give it my full belief, for I know the vicinity of our old Dutch settlements to have been very subject to marvellous events and appearances. Indeed, I have heard many stranger stories than this in the villages along the Hudson, all of which were too well authenticated to admit of a doubt. I have even talked with Rip Van Winkle myself, who when last I saw him was a very venerable old man, and so perfectly rational and consistent on every other point, that I think no conscientious person could refuse to take this into the bargain. Nay, I have seen a certificate on the subject, taken before a country justice, and signed with cross, in the justice's own handwriting. The story, therefore, is beyond the possibility of doubt. End quote. Diedrich Knickerbocker Postscript The following are travelling notes from a memorandum book of Mr. Knickerbocker. The Katzberg, or Catskill Mountains, have always been a region full of fable. The Indians considered them the abode of spirits who influenced the weather, spreading sunshine or clouds over the landscape, and sending good or bad hunting seasons. They were ruled by an old squaw spirit said to be their mother. She dwelt on the highest peak of the Catskills, and had charge of the doors of day and night to open and shut them at the proper hour. She hung up the new moons in the skies, and cut up the old ones into stars. In times of drought, if properly propitiated, she would spin light summer clouds out of cobwebs and morning dew, and send them off from the crest of the mountain, flake after flake, like flakes of carded cotton, to float in the air, until, dissolved by the heat of the sun, they would fall in gentle showers, causing the grass to spring, the fruits to ripen, and the corn to grow an inch an hour. If displeased, however, she would brew up clouds black as ink, sitting in the midst of them like a bottle-bellied spider in the midst of its web, and when these clouds broke, woe betide the valleys. In old times, say the Indian traditions, there was a kind of manito or spirit, who kept about the wildest recesses of the Catskill Mountains, and took a mischievous pleasure in wreaking all kinds of evils and vexations upon the red men. Sometimes he would assume the form of a bear, a panther, or a deer, lead the bewildered hunter a weary chase through tangled forests and among ragged rocks, and then spring off with a loud ho-ho, leaving him aghast on the brink of a beetling precipice or raging torrent. The favorite abode of this manito is still shown. It is a rock or cliff on the loneliest port of the mountains, and, from the flowering vines which clamor about it, and the wild flowers which abound in its neighborhood, is known by the name of the Garden Rock. Near the foot of it is a small lake, the haunt of the solitary bittern, with water-snakes basking in the sun on the leaves of the pond-lilies which lie on the surface. This place was held in great awe by the Indians, insomuch that the boldest hunter would not pursue his game within its precincts. Once upon a time, however, a hunter who had lost his way penetrated to the garden rock, where he beheld a number of gourds placed in the crotches of trees. One of these he seized and made off with it, but in the hurry of his retreat he let it fall among the rocks, when a great stream gushed forth, which washed him away and swept him down precipices, where he was dished to pieces, and the stream made its way to the Hudson, 
and continues to flow to the present day, being the identical stream known by the name of the Catterskill. End of section 5 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York, July 2011Section 6 of the Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman by Washington Irving. Section 6 English Writers on America. Methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant nation, rousting herself like a strong man after sleep, and shaking her invincible locks. Methinks I see her as an eagle, mewing her mighty youth, and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday beam. Milton on the Liberty of the Press It is with feelings of deep regret that I observe the literary animosity daily growing up between England and America. Great curiosity has been awakened of late with respect to the United States, and the London press has teemed with volumes of travels through the Republic. But they seem intended to diffuse error rather than knowledge, and so successful have they been that notwithstanding the constant intercourse between the nations, there is no people concerning whom the great mass of the British public have less pure information or entertain more numerous prejudices. English travellers are the best and the worst in the world. Where no motives of pride or interest intervene, none can equal them for profound and philosophical views of society, or faithful and graphical description of external objects. But when either the interest or reputation of their own country comes in collision with that of another, they go to the opposite extreme and forget their usual probity and candour in the indulgence of splenetic remark and an illiberal spirit of ridicule hence their travels are more honest and accurate the more remote the country described i would place implicit confidence in an englishman's description of the regions beyond the cataracts of the nile of unknown islands in the yellow sea of the interior of india or of any other tract which other travellers might be apt to picture out with the illusions of their fancies but I would cautiously receive his account of his immediate neighbors, and of those nations with which he is in habits of most frequent intercourse. However I might be disposed to trust his probity, I dare not trust his prejudices. It has also been the peculiar lot of our country to be visited by the worst kind of English travelers, while men of philosophical spirit and cultivated minds have been sent from England to ransack the poles, to penetrate the deserts, and to study the manners and customs of barbarous nations, with which he can have no permanent intercourse of profit or pleasure. It has been left to the broken-down tradesman, the scheming adventurer, the wandering mechanic, the Manchester and Birmingham agent, to be her oracles respecting America. From such sources she is content to receive her information respecting a country in a singular state of moral and physical development a country in which one of the greatest political experiments in the history of the world is now performing and which presents the most profound and momentous studies to the statesman and the philosopher that such men should give prejudicial accounts of america is not a matter of surprise the themes it offers for contemplation are too vast and elevated for their capacities the national character is yet in a state of fermentation it may have its frothiness and sediment but its ingredients are sound and wholesome it has already given proofs of powerful and generous qualities and the whole promises to settle down into something substantially excellent but the causes which are operating to strengthen and ennoble it and its daily indications of admiral properties are all lost upon these purblind observers who are only affected by the little asperities incident to its present situation. They are capable of judging only of the surface of things, of those matters which come in contact with their private interests and personal gratifications. They miss some of the snug conveniences and petty comforts which belong to an old, highly finished, 
an over-populous state of society, where the ranks of useful labor are crowded, and many earn a painful and servile subsistence by studying the very caprices of appetite and self-indulgence. These minor comforts, however, are all important in the estimation of narrow minds, which either do not perceive or will not acknowledge that they are more than counterbalanced among us by great and generally diffused blessings. They may, perhaps, have been disappointed in some unreasonable expectation of sudden gain. They may have pictured America to themselves, an El Dorado, where gold and silver abounded, and the natives were lacking in sagacity, and where they were to become strangely and suddenly rich in some unforeseen but easy manner. The same weakness of mind that indulges absurd expectations produces petulance and disappointment such persons become embittered against the country on finding that there as everywhere else a man must sow before he can reap must win wealth by industry and talent and must contend with the common difficulties of nature and the shrewdness of an intelligent and enterprising people perhaps through mistaken or ill-directed hospitality or from the prompt disposition to cheer and countenance the stranger prevalent among my countrymen they may have been treated with unwonted respect in america and having been accustomed all their lives to consider themselves below the surface of good society and brought up in a servile feeling of inferiority they become arrogant on the common boon of civility they attribute to the lowliness of others their own elevation, and underrate a society where there are no artificial distinctions, and where by any chance such individuals as themselves can rise to consequence. One would suppose, however, that information coming from such sources on a subject where the truth is so desirable would be received with caution by the censors of the press, that the motives of these men, their veracity, their opportunities of inquiry and observation, and their capacities for judging correctly would be rigorously scrutinized before their evidence was admitted in such sweeping extent against a kindred nation the very reverse however is the case and it furnishes a striking instance of human inconsistency nothing can surpass the vigilance with which english critics will examine the credibility of the traveller who publishes an account of some distant and comparatively unimportant country how warily will they compare the measurements of a pyramid or the description of a ruin and how sternly will they censure any inaccuracy in these contributions of merely curious knowledge while they will receive with eagerness and unhesitating faith the gross misrepresentations of coarse and obscure writers concerning a country with which their own is placed in the most important and delicate relations nay they will even make these apocryphal volumes text-books on which to enlarge with a zeal and an ability worthy of a more generous cause i shall not however dwell on this irksome and hackneyed topic nor should i have adverted to it but for the undue interest apparently taken in it by my countrymen and certain injurious effects which i apprehend it might produce upon the national feeling we attach too much consequence to these attacks they cannot do us any essential injury the tissue of misrepresentations attempted to be woven round us are like cobwebs woven round the limbs of an infant giant our country continually outgrows them one falsehood after another falls off of itself we have but to live on and every day we live a whole volume of refutation all the writers of england united if we could for a moment suppose their great minds stooping to so unworthy a combination could not conceal our rapidly growing importance and matchless prosperity they could not conceal that these are owing not merely to physical and local but also to moral causes to the political liberty the general diffusion of knowledge the prevalence of sound moral and religious principles which give force and sustained energy to the character of a people, and which, in fact, have been the acknowledged and wonderful supporters of their own national power and glory. But why are we so exquisitely alive to the aspersions of England? Why do we suffer ourselves to be so affected by the contumely she has endeavored to cast upon us? It is not in the opinion of England alone that honor lives and reputation has its being the world at large is the arbiter of a nation's fame with its thousand eyes it witnesses a nation's deeds and from their collective testimony 
is national glory or national disgrace established for ourselves therefore it is comparatively of but little importance whether england does us justice or not it is perhaps of far more importance to herself she is instilling anger and resentment into the bosom of a youthful nation to grow with its growth and strengthen with its strength if in america as some of her writers are laboring to convince her she is hereafter to find an invidious rival and a gigantic foe she may thank those very writers for having provoked rivalship and irritated hostility every one knows the all-pervading influence of literature at the present day and how much the opinions and passions of mankind are under its control the mere contests of the sword are temporary their wounds are but in the flesh and it is the pride of the generous to forgive and forget them but the slanders of the pen pierce to the heart they rankle longest in the noblest spirits they dwell ever present in the mind and render it morbidly sensitive to the most trifling collision it is but seldom that any one overt act produces hostilities between two nations there exists most commonly a previous jealousy and ill-will a predisposition to take offence trace these to their cause and how often will they be found to originate in the mischievous effusions of mercenary writers who secure in their closets and for ignominious bread concoct and circulate the venom that is to inflame the generous and the brave i am not laying too much stress upon this point for it applies most emphatically to our particular case over no nation does the press hold a more absolute control than over the people of america for the universal education of the poorest classes makes every individual a reader there is nothing published in england on the subject of our country that does not circulate through every part of it there is not a calumny dropped from an english pen nor an unworthy sarcasm uttered by an english statesman that does not go to blight good will and add to the mass of latent resentment possessing then as england does the fountain-head whence the literature of the language flows how completely is it in her power and how truly is it her duty to make it the medium of amiable and magnanimous feeling a stream where the two nations might meet together and drink in peace and kindness should she however persist in turning it to waters of bitterness the time may come when she may repent her folly the present friendship of america may be of but little moment to her but the future destinies of that country do not admit of a doubt over those of england there lower some shadows of uncertainty should then a day of gloom arrive should those reverses overtake her from which the proudest empires have not been exempt she may look back with regret at her infatuation in repulsing from her side a nation she might have grappled to her bosom and thus destroying her only chance for real friendship beyond the boundaries of her own dominions there is a general impression in england that the people of the united states are inimical to the parent country it is one of the errors which have been diligently propagated by designing writers there is doubtless considerable political hostility and a general soreness at the illiberality of the english press but collectively speaking the prepossessions of the people are strongly in favor of england indeed at one time they amounted in many parts of the union to an absurd degree of bigotry the bare name of englishman was a passport to the confidence and hospitality of every family and too often gave a transient currency to the worthless and the ungrateful throughout the country there was something of enthusiasm connected with the idea of england we looked to it with a hallowed feeling of tenderness and veneration as the land of our forefathers the august repository of the monuments and antiquities of our race the birthplace and mausoleum of the sages and heroes of our paternal history after our own country there was none in whose glory we more delighted none whose good opinion we were more anxious to possess none toward which our hearts yearned with such throbbings of warm consanguinity even during the late war whenever there was the least opportunity for kind feelings to spring forth it was the delight of the generous spirits of our country to show that in the midst of hostilities they still kept alive the sparks of future friendship is all this to be at an end 
is this golden band of kindred sympathies so rare between nations to be broken forever perhaps it is for the best it may dispel an illusion which might have kept us in mental vassalage which might have interfered occasionally with our true interests and prevented the growth of proper national pride but it is hard to give up the kindred tie and there are feelings dearer than interest closer to the heart than pride that will still make us cast back a look of regret as we wander farther and farther from the paternal roof and lament the waywardness of the parent that would repel the affections of the child short-sighted and injudicious however as the conduct or england may be in this system of aspersion recrimination on our part would be equally ill-judged i speak not of a prompt and spirited vindication of our country or the keenest castigation of her slanderers but i allude to a disposition to retaliate in kind to retort sarcasm and inspire prejudice which seems to be spreading widely among our writers let us guard particularly against such a temper for it would double the evil instead of redressing the wrong nothing is so easy and inviting as the retort of abuse and sarcasm but it is a paltry and an unprofitable contest it is the alternative of a morbid mind fretted into petulance rather than warmed into indignation if england is willing to permit the mean jealousies of trade or the rancorous animosities of politics to deprave the integrity of her press and poison the fountain of public opinion let us beware of her example she may deem it her interest to diffuse error and engender antipathy for the purpose of checking emigration we have no purpose of the kind to serve neither have we any spirit of national jealousy to gratify for as yet in all our rivalships with england we are the rising and the gaining party there can be no end to answer therefore but the gratification of resentment a mere spirit of retaliation and even that is impotent our retorts are never republished in england they fall short therefore of their aim but they foster a querulous and peevish temper among our writers they sour the sweet flow of our early literature and sow thorns and brambles among its blossoms what is still worse they circulate through our own country and as far as they have effect excite virulent national prejudices this last is the evil most especially to be deprecated governed as we are entirely by public opinion the utmost care should be taken to preserve the purity of the public mind knowledge is power and truth is knowledge whoever therefore knowingly propagates a prejudice willfully saps the foundation of his country's strength the members of a republic above all other men should be candid and dispassionate they are individually portions of the sovereign mind and sovereign will and should be enabled to come to all questions of national concern with calm and unbiased judgments from the peculiar nature of our relations with england we must have more frequent questions of a difficult and delicate character with her than with any other nation questions that affect the most acute and excitable feelings and as in the adjustment of these our national measures must ultimately be determined by popular sentiment we cannot be too anxiously attentive to purify it from all latent passion or prepossession opening too as we do an asylum for strangers every portion of the earth we should receive all with impartiality it should be our pride to exhibit an example of one nation at least destitute of national antipathies and exercising not merely the overt acts of hospitality but those more rare and noble courtesies which spring from liberality of opinion what have we to do with national prejudices they are the inveterate diseases of old countries contracted in rude and ignorant ages when nations knew but little of each other and looked beyond their own boundaries with distrust and hostility we on the contrary have sprung into national existence in an enlightened and philosophic age when the different parts of the habitable world and the various branches of the human family have been indefatigably studied and made known to each other and we forego the advantages of our birth if we do not shake off the national prejudices as we would the local superstitions of the old world 
but above all let us not be influenced by any angry feelings so far as to shut our eyes to the perception of what is really excellent and amiable in the english character we are a young people necessarily an imitative one and must take our examples and models in a great degree from the existing nations of europe there is no country more worthy of our study than england the spirit of her constitution is most analogous to ours the manners of her people their intellectual activity their freedom of opinion their habits of thinking on those subjects which concern the dearest interests and most sacred charities of private life are all congenial to the american character and in fact are all intrinsically excellent for it is in the moral feeling of the people that the deep foundations of british prosperity are laid and however the superstructure may be time-worn or overrun by abuses there must be something solid in the basis admirable in the materials and stable in the structure of an edifice that so long has towered unshaken amidst the tempests of the world let it be the pride of our writers therefore discarding all feelings of irritation and disdaining to retaliate the illiberality of british authors to speak of the English nation without prejudice and with determined candor. While they rebuke the indiscriminating bigotry with which some of our countrymen admire and imitate everything English, merely because it is English, let them frankly point out what is really worthy of approbation. We may thus place England before us as a perpetual volume of reference, wherein are recorded sound deductions from ages of experience and while we avoid the errors and absurdities which may have crept into the page we may draw thence golden maxims of practical wisdom wherewith to strengthen and to embellish our national character end of section six recording by pamela krantz seven of the sketchbook of geoffrey crayon gentlemen this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon Gentleman by Washington Irving. Rural Life in England. Oh, friendly to the best pursuits of man, friendly to thought, to virtue, and to peace, domestic life in rural pleasures past. Cowper. The stranger who would form a correct opinion of the English character must not confine his observations to the metropolis. He must go forth into the country. He must sojourn in villages and hamlets. He must visit castles, villas, farmhouses, cottages. He must wander through parks and gardens, along hedges and green lanes. He must loiter about country churches, attend wakes and fairs and other rural festivities, and cope with the people in all their conditions and all their habits and humours. In some countries the large cities absorb the wealth and fashion of the nation. They are the only fixed abodes of elegant and intelligent society and the country is inhabited almost entirely by boorish peasantry. In England, on the contrary, the metropolis is a mere gathering place, or general rendezvous, of the polite classes, where they devote a small portion of the year to a hurry of gaiety and dissipation, and, having indulged this kind of carnival, return again to the apparently more congenial habits of rural life. The various orders of society are therefore diffused over the whole surface of the kingdom, and the more retired neighbourhoods afford specimens of the different ranks. The English, in fact, are strongly gifted with the rural feeling. They possess a quick sensibility to the beauties of nature, and a keen relish for the pleasures and employments of the country. This passion seems inerrant in them. Even the inhabitants of cities, born and brought up among brick walls and bustling streets, enter with facility into rural habits, and events a tact for rural occupation. The merchant has his snug retreat in the vicinity of the metropolis, where he often displays as much pride and zeal in the cultivation of his flower-garden, and the maturing of his fruits, as he does in the conduct of his business, and the success of a commercial enterprise. 
even those less fortunate individuals who are doomed to pass their lives in the midst of din and traffic contrive to have something that shall remind them of the green aspect of nature in the most dark and dingy quarters of the city the drawing-room window resembles frequently a bank of flowers every spot capable of vegetation has its grass plot and flower bed and every square its mimic park laid out with picturesque taste and gleaming with refreshing verdure those who see the englishman only in town are apt to form an unfavourable opinion of his social character he is either absorbed in business or distracted by the thousand engagements that dissipate time thought and feeling in this huge metropolis he has therefore too commonly a look of hurry and abstraction wherever he happens to be he is on the point of going somewhere else at the moment he is talking on one subject his mind is wandering to another and while paying a friendly visit he is calculating how he shall economize time so as to pay the other visits allotted to the morning an immense metropolis like london is calculated to make men selfish and uninteresting in their casual and transient meetings they can but deal briefly in commonplaces they present but the cold superficies of character its rich and genial qualities have no time to be warmed into a flow it is in the country that the englishman gives scope to his natural feelings he breaks loose gladly from the cold formalities and negative civilities of town throws off his habits of shy reserve and becomes joyous and free-hearted he manages to collect round him all the conveniences and elegancies of polite life and to banish its restraints his country seat abounds with every requisite either for studious retirement tasteful gratification or rural exercise books paintings music horses dogs and sporting implements of all kinds are at hand he puts no constraint either upon his guests or himself but in the true spirit of hospitality provides the means of enjoyment and leaves every one to partake according to his inclination the taste of the english in the cultivation of land and in what is called landscape gardening is unrivalled they have studied nature intently and discovered an exquisite sense of her beautiful forms and harmonious combinations those charms which in other countries she lavishes in wild solitudes are here assembled round the haunts of domestic life they seem to have caught her coy and furtive graces and spread them like witchery about their rural abodes nothing can be more imposing than the magnificence of english park scenery vast lawns that extend like sheets of vivid green with here and there clumps of gigantic trees heaping up rich piles of foliage the solemn pomp of groves and woodland glades with the deer trooping in silent herds across them the hare bounding away to the covert or the pheasant suddenly bursting upon the wing the brook taught to wind in natural meanderings or expand into a glassy lake the sequestered pool reflecting the quivering trees with the yellow leaf sleeping on its bosom and the trout roaming fearlessly about its limpid waters while some rustic temple or sylvan statue grown green and dank with age gives an air of classic sanctity to the seclusion these are but a few of the features of park scenery but what the most delights me is the creative talent in which the english decorate the unostentatious abodes of middle life the rudest habitation the most unpromising and scanty portion of land in the hands of an englishman of taste becomes a little paradise with a nicely discriminating eye he seizes at once upon its capabilities and pictures in his mind the future landscape the sterile spot grows into loveliness under his hand and yet the operations of art which produce the effect are scarcely to be perceived the cherishing and training of some trees the cautious pruning of others the nice distribution of flowers and plants of tender and graceful foliage the introduction of a green slope of velvet turf the partial opening to a peep of blue distance or silver gleam of water all these are managed with a delicate tact a pervading yet quiet assiduity like the magic touchings with which a painter finishes up a favourite picture the residence of people of fortune and refinement in the country has diffused a degree of taste and elegance in rural economy that descends to the lowest class the very labourer with his thatched cottage and narrow slip of ground attends to their embellishment 
the trim hedge the grass plot before the door the little flower-bed bordered with snug box the wood buying trained up against the wall and hanging its blossoms about the lattice the pot of flowers in the window the holly providentially planted about the house to cheat winter of its dreariness and to throw in a semblance of green summer to cheer the fireside all these bespeak the influence of taste flowing down from high sources and pervading the lowest levels of the public mind if ever love as poets sing delights to visit a cottage it must be the cottage of an english peasant the fondness for rural life among the higher classes of the english has had a great and salutary effect upon the national character i do not know a finer race of men than the english gentlemen instead of the softness and effeminacy which characterize the men of rank in most countries they exhibit a union of elegance and strength a robustness of frame and freshness of complexion which i am inclined to attribute to their living so much in the open air and pursuing so eagerly the invigorating recreations of the country the hardy exercises produce also a healthful tone of mind and spirits and a manliness and simplicity of manners which even the follies and dissipations of the town cannot easily pervert and can never entirely destroy in the country too the different orders of society seem to approach more freely to be more disposed to blend and operate favourably upon each other the distinctions between them do not appear to be so marked and impassable as in the cities the manner in which property has been distributed into small estates and farms has established a regular gradation from the nobleman through the classes of gentry small landed proprietors and substantial farmers down to the labouring peasantry and while it has thus banded the extremes of society together has infused into each intermediate rank a spirit of independence this it must be confessed is not so universally the case at present as it was formerly the larger estates having in late years of distress absorbed the smaller and in some parts of the country almost annihilated the sturdy race of small farmers these however i believe are but casual breaks in the general system i have mentioned in rural occupation there is nothing mean and debasing it leads a man forth among scenes of natural grandeur and beauty it leaves him to the workings of his own mind operated upon by the purest and most elevating of external influences such a man may be simple and rough but he cannot be vulgar the man of refinement therefore finds nothing revolting in an intercourse with the lower orders in rural life as he does when he casually mingles with the lower orders of cities he lays aside his distance and reserve and is glad to waive the distinctions of rank and to enter into the honest heartfelt enjoyments of common life indeed the very amusements of the country bring men more and more together and the sound hound and horn blend all feelings into harmony i believe this is one great reason why the nobility and gentry are more popular among the inferior orders in england than they are in any other country and why the latter have endured so many excessive pressures and extremities without repining more generally at the unequal distribution of fortune and privilege to this mingling of cultivated and rustic society may also be attributed the rural feeling that runs through british literature the frequent use of illustrations from rural life those incomparable descriptions of nature that abound in the british poets that have continued down from the flowers and the leaf of chaucer and have brought into our closets all the freshness and fragrance of the dewy landscape the pastoral writers of other countries appear as if they had paid nature an occasional visit and become acquainted with her general charms but the british poets have lived and revelled with her and they have wooed her in her most secret haunts and they have watched her minutest caprices a spray could not tremble the breeze a leaf could not rustle to the ground a diamond drop could not patter in the stream a fragrance could not exhale from the humble violet nor a daisy unfold its crimson tents to the morning but it has been noticed by these impassioned and delicate observers and wrought upon into some beautiful morality the effect of this devotion of elegant minds to rural occupations has been wonderful on the face of the country a great part of the island is rather level and would be monotonous were it not for the charms of culture but it is studded and gemmed as it were with castles and palaces and embroidered with parks and gardens it does not abound in grand and sublime prospects but rather in little home scenes of rural repose and sheltered quiet every antique farmhouse and moss-grown cottage is a picture 
and as the roads are continually winding and the view is shut in by groves and hedges the eye is delighted by a continual succession of small landscapes of captivating loveliness the great charm however of english scenery is the moral feeling that seems to pervade it it is associated in the mind with ideas of order of quiet of sober well-established principles of hoary usage and reverend custom everything seems to be the growth of ages of regular and peaceful existence the old church of remote architecture with its low massive portal its gothic tower its windows rich with tracery and painted glass in scrupulous preservation its stately monuments of warriors and worthies of the olden time ancestors of the present lords of the soil its tombstones recording successive generations of sturdy yeomanry whose progeny still plough the same fields and kneel at the same altar the parsonage a quaint irregular pile partly antiquated but repaired and altered in the tastes of various ages and occupants the stile and footpath leading from the churchyard across pleasant fields and along shady hedgerows according to an immemorial right of way the neighbouring village with its venerable cottages its public green sheltered by trees under which the forefathers of the present race have sported the antique family mansion standing apart in some little rural domain but looking down with a protecting air on the surrounding scene all these common features of english landscape evince a calm and settled security a hereditary transmission of home-bred virtues and local attachments that speak deeply and touchingly for the moral character of the nation it is a pleasing sight of a sunday morning when the bell is sending its sober melody across the quiet fields to behold the peasantry in their best finery with ruddy faces and modest cheerfulness thronging tranquilly along the green lanes to church but it is still more pleasing to see them in the evenings gathering about their cottage doors and appearing to exult in the humble comforts and embellishments which their own hands have spread around them it is this sweet home feeling this settled repose of affection in the domestic scene that is after all the parent of the steadiest virtues and purest enjoyments and i cannot close these desultory remarks better than by quoting the words of a modern english poet who has depicted it with remarkable felicity through each gradation from the castled hall the city dome the villa crowned with shade but chief from modest mansions numberless in town or hamlet sheltering middle life down to the cottaged vale and straw-roofed shed this western isle has long been famed for scenes where bliss domestic finds a dwelling-place domestic bliss that like a harmless dove honour and sweet endearment keeping guard can centre in a little quiet nest all that desire would fly for through the earth that can the world excluding be itself a world enjoyed that wants no witnesses but its own sharers and approving heaven that like a flower deep hid in a rock cleft smiles though tis looking only at the sky from a poem on the death of the princess charlotte by the rev ran kennedy a m end of section seven Recording by Jean Bascom, Potomac, Maryland. Eight of the Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman, by Washington Irving section eight the broken heart i never heard of any true affection but twas nipped with care that like the caterpillar eats the leaves of the spring's sweetest book the rose middleton it is a common practice with those who have outlived the susceptibility of early feeling or have been brought up in the gay heartlessness of dissipated life to laugh at all love stories and to treat the tales of romantic passion as mere fictions of novelists and poets my observations on human nature have induced me to think otherwise they have convinced me that however the surface of the character may be chilled and frozen by the cares of the world or cultivated into mere smiles by the arts of society still there are dormant fires lurking in the depths of the coldest bosom which when once enkindled 
become impetuous and are sometimes desolating in their effects indeed i am a true believer in the blind deity and go to the full extent of his doctrines shall i confess it i believe in broken hearts and the possibility of dying of disappointed love i do not however consider it a malady often fatal to my own sex but i firmly believe that it withers down many a lovely woman into an early grave man is the creature of interest and ambition his nature leads him forth into the struggle and bustle of the world love is but the embellishment of his early life or a song piped in the intervals of the acts he seeks for fame for fortune for space in the world's thought and dominion over his fellow men but a woman's whole life is a history of the affections the heart is her world it is there her ambition strives for empire it is there her avarice seeks for hidden treasures she sends forth her sympathies on adventure she embarks her whole soul in the traffic of affection and if shipwrecked her case is hopeless for it is a bankruptcy of the heart to a man the disappointment of love may occasion some bitter pangs it wounds some feelings of tenderness it blasts some prospects of felicity but he is an active being he may dissipate his thoughts in the whirl of varied occupation or may plunge into the tide of pleasure or if the scene of disappointment be too full of painful associations he can shift his abode at will and taking as it were the wings of the morning can fly to the uttermost parts of the earth and be at rest but woman's is comparatively a fixed a secluded and meditative life she is more the companion of her own thoughts and feelings and if they are turned to ministers of sorrow where shall she look for consolation her lot is to be wooed and won and if unhappy in her love her heart is like some fortress that has been captured and sacked and abandoned and left desolate how many bright eyes grow dim how many soft cheeks grow pale how many lovely forms fade away into the tomb and none can tell the cause that blighted their loveliness as the dove will clasp its wings to its side and cover and conceal the arrow that is preying on its vitals so it is the nature of woman to hide from the world the pangs of wounded affection the love of a delicate female is always shy and silent even when fortunate she scarcely breathes it to herself but when otherwise she buries it in the recesses of her bosom and there lets it cower and brood among the ruins of her peace with her the desire of her heart has failed the great charm of existence is at an end she neglects all the cheerful exercises which gladden the spirits quicken the pulses and send the tide of life in healthful currents through the veins her rest is broken the sweet refreshment of sleep is poisoned by melancholy dreams dry sorrow drinks her blood until her enfeebled frame sinks under the slightest external injury look for her after a little while and you'll find friendship weeping over her untimely grave and wondering that one who but lately glowed with all the radiance of health and beauty should so speedily be brought down to darkness and the worm you will be told of some wintry chill some casual indisposition that laid her low but no one knows of the mental malady which previously sapped her strength and made her so easy a prey to the spoiler she is like some tender tree the pride and beauty of the grove graceful in its form bright in its foliage but with a worm preying at its heart we find it suddenly withering when it should be most fresh and luxuriant we see it drooping its branches to the earth and shedding leaf by leaf until wasted and perished away it falls even in the stillness of the forest and as we muse over the beautiful ruin we strive in vain to recollect the blast or thunderbolt that could have smitten it with decay i have seen many instances of women running to waste and self-neglect and disappearing gradually from the earth almost as if they had been exhaled to heaven and have repeatedly fancied 
that I could trace their deaths through the various declinations of consumption, cold, debility, languor, melancholy, until I reached the first symptom of disappointed love. But an instance of the kind was lately told to me. The circumstances are well known in the country where they happened, and I shall but give them in the manner in which they were related. Every one must recollect the tragic story of young Ernest, the Irish patriot. It was too touching to be soon forgotten. During the troubles in Ireland, he was tried, condemned, and executed on a charge of treason. His fate made a deep impression on public sympathy. He was so young, so intelligent, so generous, so brave, so everything that we are apt to like in a young man. His conduct under trial, too, was so lofty and intrepid. The noble indignation with which he repelled the charge of treason against his country, the eloquent vindication of his name, and his pathetic appeal to posterity in the hopeless hour of condemnation, all these entered deeply into every generous bosom, and even his enemies lamented the stern policy that dictated his execution. But there was one heart whose anguish it would be impossible to describe. In happier days and fairer fortunes he had won the affections of a beautiful and interesting girl, the daughter of a late celebrated Irish barrister. She loved him with the disinterested fervor of a woman's first and early love. When every worldly maxim arrayed itself against him, when blasted in fortune and disgrace and danger darkened around his name, she loved him the more ardently for his very sufferings. If, then, his fate could awaken the sympathy even of his foes, what must have been the agony of her, whose whole soul was occupied by his image? Let those tell who have had the portals of the tomb suddenly closed between them and the being they most loved on earth, who have sat at its threshold as one shut out in a cold and lonely world, whence all that was most lovely and loving had departed. But then the horrors of such a grave, so frightful, so dishonored, there was nothing for memory to dwell on that could soothe the pang of separation, none of those tender though melancholy circumstances which endear the parting scene, nothing to melt sorrow into those blessed tears, sent like the dews of heaven, to revive the heart in the parting hour of anguish. To render her widowed situation more desolate, she had incurred her father's displeasure by her unfortunate attachment and was an exile from the parental roof. But could the sympathy and kind offices of friends have reached a spirit so shocked and driven by horror? She would have experienced no want of consolation, for the Irish are a people of quick and generous sensibilities. The most delicate and cherishing attentions were paid her by families of wealth and distinction. She was led into society, and they tried by all kinds of occupation and amusement to dissipate her grief, and wean her from the tragical story of her loves. But it was all in vain. There are some strokes of calamity that scathe and scorch the soul, which penetrate to the vital seat of happiness, and blast it, never again to put forth bud or blossom. She never objected to frequent the haunts of pleasure, but was as much alone there as in the depths of solitude, walking about in a sad reverie apparently unconscious of the world around her she carried with her an inward woe that mocked at all the blandishments of friendship and heeded not the song of the charmer charm he never so wisely the person who told me her story had seen her at a masquerade there can be no exhibition of far gone wretchedness more striking and painful than to meet it in such a scene to find it wandering like a spectre lonely and joyless where all around is gay to see it dressed out in the trappings of mirth and looking so wan and woebegone as if it had tried in vain to cheat the poor heart into momentary forgetfulness of sorrow after strolling through the splendid rooms and giddy crowd with an air of utter abstraction she sat herself down on the steps of an orchestra and looking about for some time with a vacant air that showed her insensibility to the garish scene, she began 
with the capriciousness of a sickly heart, to warble a little plaintive air. She had an exquisite voice, but on this occasion it was so simple, so touching, it breathed forth such a soul of wretchedness, that she drew a crowd, mute and silent, around her, and melted every one into tears. The story of one so true and tender could not but excite great interest in a country remarkable for enthusiasm. It completely won the heart of a brave officer, who paid his addresses to her, and thought that one so true to the dead could not but prove affectionate to the living. She declined his attentions, for her thoughts were irrevocably engrossed by the memory of her former lover. He, however, persisted in his suit. He solicited not her tenderness, but her esteem. He was assisted by her conviction of his worth, and her sense of her own destitute and dependent situation, for she was existing on the kindness of friends. In a word, he at length succeeded in gaining her hand, though with a solemn assurance that her heart was unalterably another's. He took her with him to Sicily hoping that a change of scene might wear out the remembrance of early woes. She was an amiable and exemplary wife, and made an effort to be a happy one, but nothing could cure the silent and devouring melancholy that had entered into her very soul. She wasted away in a slow but hopeless decline, and at length sunk into the grave, the victim of a broken heart. It was on her that Moor, the distinguished Irish poet composed the following lines. She is far from the land where her young hero sleeps, and lovers around her are sighing, but coldly she turns from their gaze and weeps, for her heart in his grave is lying. She sings the wild song of her dear native plains, every note which he loved awaking. Ah, little they think who delight in her strains, how the heart of the minstrel is breaking. He had lived for his love, for his country he died, they were all that to life had entwined him. Nor soon shall the tears of his country be dried, nor long will his love stay behind him. Oh, make her a grave where the sunbeams rest, when they promise a glorious morrow. They'll shine o'er her sleep, like a smile from the west, from her own loved island. Of sorrow. End of section eight.